you will experience a quite different session today. That's why I also don't introduce myself in the beginning. I start with a question for you. And the question is, would you risk your life to go to a museum? <laughs> yeah, I see the shaking heads. Me neither, and neither this guy here. So what I'll be doing today is to tell you two stories, and I hope they will show you what visual catalyzation is and how it could be useful for your work as leaders, consultants, students, whoever is in the room. And the first story is about Fred, and Fred, as you can see, lived kind of in the Stone Age, and he is one of the creators of those famous cave paintings in Las Croix, close to Montignac in South France, that date back to around 40,000 years from today, where we are at the moment. And also Fred and his friends, they, didn't really, they were not really up for risking their lives in order to go to a museum. As you see, there's this dangerous cave with ice in the, in the shadows, you know. Um, so chances were quite high that when those cavemen, as we call them today, went there to do their kind of work, they would encounter bears or other predators. So it was, in a way, quite dangerous. And yet, there are those cave paintings deep down in the caves. But first, let me tell you a couple of things about me. As you clearly can see, this is me. And my name is Markus Engelberger. I'm from Vienna, Austria. And to keep it in a nutshell, I help other people to unfold their creative wings. That's my vision, purpose, mission, uh, all at once. Um, and I do so mainly using pen and paper, analog tools. So my weapon of choice is our pens, markers, paper. Yeah, and that quite stands out in the digital age that we are in. So probably some of you also attended the talk of my friend David Sachs who spoke about analog tools and the power in the digital age. So that's what I'm talking about too, or a very small aspect of that is my work with pen and paper. And what I do with pen and paper could look a little bit like this. It's called graphic recording. What is graphic recording? You can see me do it this afternoon. Basically, it means I participate in events, in meetings, in strategy sessions of all kinds, and I listen to conversations, and I capture those conversations, key messages of those conversations and dialogues in real time, and I try to structure them in a meaningful way, or in a way meaningful to the group. Plus, I also add some visual elements to it for orientation and to make it also more appealing to look at this picture. That's the graphic recording part. And then I'm also a moderator. So one part of my work is to take information and help people see what they actually mean. <laughs> and the other part of my work is to bring back those pictures to the discussion, to the table. Yeah, and help group really sharpen their ideas and develop their ideas and grow their impact through visualization. And at the end of the day, we often end up with maps, with knowledge maps, you could call it. And it brings me back to the cave. <laughs> it brings me back to the cave where Fred is at work. And Fred is, for instance, drawing a herd of buffaloes, let's say. This is how buffaloes looked back then and how you find them in the caves. And imagine you're part of a prehistoric tribe and your family, your tribe was really dependent on those herds of buffaloes crossing your territory. And if that happens once a year, twice a year, three times a year, it really matters to have a good plan and to know where everybody will be standing and who is the guy that throws the first spear, right? So in other words, they used visualization for planning and decision-making. And planning and decision-making makes a lot of sense if you are on your own already. It makes even more sense <laughs> if you do it together with others. 
A second reason why those cave paintings exist is also to capture ideas, to capture knowledge. And this is where my work, this is why I'm here actually at the World Knowledge Forum. This is where my work connects to the theme of the forum and to perspic perspicacity um, and to knowledge. Um, it's all about capturing the knowledge of the tribe and passing it on to a next generation in a form of stories. Stories help us structure information, share information, recall information, but also in the form of pictures, because it was quite crucial for the survival of the tribe that the next generation knows where the water hole is and how to make fire and how to hunt the buffaloes. And of course, I ask you, would you risk your life to go to the museum? Of course, there was also an aesthetic and cultural and spiritual element to the whole drawing process. But it was not the only reason. They don't, didn't just go there to have their festivities and, and use colors. It was uh, actually those two reasons. And it quite closely connects to the work that I'm doing today. In a digital age, in an age of high information density, I would call it, in an age of high speed. And that's where we start to remember what are actually the tools that mankind has always been using. And now those tools, those analog tools, slowly, slowly come back. And I don't say, I, also me, I also worked on the iPad. I love digital. I love all the options that we have. But sometimes in human interaction, sometimes in our collaborations on a daily basis, it really makes sense to go back to pen and paper to make all the implicit ideas swirling around in the room, tangible, put it on the table, be able to touch it, to discuss it, to see what we mean. Second story is the story about how everybody in this room started to draw. So I don't know who of you have children, but so those who have children can think about their children. The other ones might think about themselves as children. Everybody in the world, every person I know, starts to draw like this. Uh, it's, is it? Yeah. <laughs> So it's, it looks quite random, and it could be done by pen or marker on paper. It could also be done with a chalk or a stone on the pavement. It could be done with a stick in the sand. Boys in areas where it snows knows that there are other ways <laughs> to leave your marks. <laughs> um, that's the first step. So we grab stuff and leave our marks in the world. The second... step in the process of learning how to draw could look a little bit like this. Those of you who have children, any idea what the difference between step one and step two is? Now we're becoming interactive. Any idea? No? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a pattern already. You're on the right track. But I tell you, the second step could also, like form-wise, could look like the first one. The pattern is part of it, but the really important difference is that in the second phase, children really know what they drew. So there was the intention behind it. They intentionally created stuff. And I also have a story to share, a short story to share with you about that. Um, a three-year-old girl, painted me this picture one day. So back in the days, I started off in youth work, then I ended up in working in an orphanage. And there was this three-year-old girl who drew me this picture. And there was a second social pedagogue or teacher, I don't know how you call it in Korean, um, working together with me. And she did what many adults do. She asked the kid, what did you draw? And the kid said, it's a tractor. Do you know what a tractor is? the vehicle you use for farming, right, the tractor. Um, and then, again, something happened, what happens very often. My colleague told the girl that this is not the way how you draw a tractor. You have to do it this way. That's the wrong way to draw a tractor. You, the right way looks like this one. And they ended up fighting, and both of them ended up crying. And when the situation calmed down, I approached the girl again and said, Alexandra? I'm curious. <laughs> Let me know 
what it, what it is that you see or that you drew, because I knew there was intention behind it. And what the girl told me was so impressive that I still tell the story today and that I still remember the story today, because you have to imagine the three-year-old girl, <laughs> tall or small as this, looking at a tractor, and all she sees is the big wheel, right? So in her, in her perception of the world, this was actually the tractor. And for her, it didn't matter much if there is a small part that <laughs> also pulls the tractor and makes poof, poof. Um, so for her, this was the tractor. And yeah, it's, it's an impressive way of, of, of seeing how intentional children can be in this phase already. And then the pattern part also speaks to our next step. We learn how to draw circles. It's not always perfect circles. You see that my circle. Um, the next step is squares and then triangles. And then we reach a phase that you probably remember because we are now well equipped with everything we need to draw a lot of houses, <laughs> which is squares <laughs> and triangles and more squares. Right, so we now can draw ho um, houses. And then a next step is we start to draw human beings who might look a little bit like this. And I don't know, again, I don't know about Korean culture. In Austria, it's a big thing that children on close to Mother's Day, they create those Mother's Day cards and then they draw their mother and sometimes the mother looks like this and say, hey, happy Mother's Day. And the mother says, oh, how cute. Yeah, so we draw what matters to us most. And it's about human interaction all the time as a child. And then children really develop this. They are eager to improve. They really love drawing. They spend a lot of time drawing, creating, because it's also fun for them. And the drawing of a nine-year-old that I saw looks a little bit like this. So it's a head and the body of a you know, thicker man, I would say. And he has a spoon in his hand. And on the spoon there are peas or cereals, I don't know. And what children know at the age of nine is that the man is eating peas, the peas are going down his throat, and they somehow end up in the belly. And because it's a fat man, there is room for a lot of peas. And that's the way children draw between the age of seven and nine. They draw, they draw what they know about the world. And they don't care if the man is cut in half or if they have x-ray vision or not. They just draw what they know. And then between nine and 12, there is this age where 90% of the people stop to draw and we really get frustrated because of our own expectations that frustrates and what is also frustrating is to get marks in school because this is the right way to draw a tractor or the right way to draw a, a sun or something um, so you get judged for your drawings and then you have peers or parents or teachers who make you <laughs> want to stop drawing yeah and that all leads to the situation we have today and that's a point I'm very passionate about because there are also good, like the reasons why cavemen drew, there are also good reasons why children draw and they matter a lot when I think about the situation we are in today. So children, I already told you this, they draw to leave their marks in the world and to create stuff to do to have an impact. Also, children love to journal. They love to capture their ideas. They love to, to capture what's going on in their lives. Also, they use drawing as a vehicle to spark their imagination and explore ideas. A very huge part is also drawing as a tool to express what can't be said. And I mean that in two ways. So. One part of it is the emotional side to so really express feelings that are somehow alive in them and children don't know what it is. And there's this whole thera art therapy field behind that idea. 
And the second part is actually the words, because they are, they are using different language than we adults do. And sometimes they are actually lacking words, and then they draw something and show you, mommy, this is what I meant. And the last part is also joy. It's also fun to draw, right? And this is already most of the ideas I want to share with you. So there's a lot, the, the key message is there's a lot that all of you in this room have to build upon. We all did it as children. Human beings always did it. And the question is, why not do it now? Also in education, also in the business world. And this is a very central picture for me. So the idea I brought you today is, in addition, I don't say only draw. Please don't get me wrong. I never said you, you should go out the door and only draw. That's wrong. But in addition to spoken and written language, in addition to the language of numbers, in addition to body language and tone of voice, and maybe also scent and melody, and there are various ways of communication. But why not, in addition to all of that, use simple depictions, simple icons, symbols, to also get across what we are trying to say, to explore ideas, to shape ideas, to anchor them in impactful learning, to explain yourself, and even to sell and pitch ideas. Because what you also realize now, everybody is quite mesmerized by the stuff that I do. It's, it's very engaging and it's something different if you're used to PowerPoint slides that are overloaded with information and then somebody comes and has a marker and this weird camera here. That really stands out. So you, I hope all of you have pen and paper ready because I'm about to share my biggest secret. Everything I know about drawing, and I'm not an artist, I told you, and everything I know about drawing is you need to be able to draw dots and lines and circles. Can you, can you still follow? <laughs> and squares and triangles. So this is the, what you would learn in the beginner's lesson and then the very advanced lesson you learn how to draw wavy lines and half circles and lines that also cross each other. But that's really advanced. And if you can do that, you can create any of the pictures I created. I, I don't use any other kind of vocabulary. That's everything really I use. And to show you that I'm not bragging or lying, I brought you a couple of examples. So imagine that this is some kind of flea market table or in your garage, so there are parts lying around. This is parts of the vocabulary. You identify some circles there. One of the circles is a little squeezed. Then there is a kind of half circle and five lines that are supposed to be equally long. You see, even I don't draw perfect. Um, and the question is, what are you able to build with this material? Normally, I do a kind of quiz. Now, as, as time is more running out, I do it more quickly. And I'll just show you step by step how I use it. So I first, I start with the two circles and they're becoming two wheels. Then I take three of the lines and create one, two, three, a first triangle. And I take the two lines that are left and make a kind of second triangle. Then I take the squeezed circle, put it here and this one goes here. This is how I draw a bicycle. So what happens in, or what could happen in a business situation and what happens a lot in the work I do is people are using terminologies and expecting the other person to know exactly what they mean. And the reality is that misunderstandings are the normality in our conversations. It's not the usual case that I say, for instance, friendship or leadership or knowledge. And the other person in the room knows exactly what I mean, because she or he has a very different opinion about it, or a very different picture in her or his mind. So let's go 
with the idea of knowledge. And the beautiful thing you could do once you leave this room and go back to your university, go back to your team, to your business, is you could try it out. You could, for instance, say knowledge or digitalization or transformation or you name it, right? Perspicacity. And then invite the others around the table to draw their very simple visual representation of it. What do I mean? So knowledge could be, I, some, I hope I did it right. Knowledge could look like this, right? Knowledge could look like this. For the second person, it could look like, like a light bulb. For the third person, it could look like this university hat. Right? What is knowledge? For the next person, it could be the knowledge owl. Or it could be a seedling that is planted in the soil and slowly starts to grow and thrive. It could be a plane that stands for traveling and going to places and learning about the world. So it could be so many different things. And the interesting thing is, once all this implicit knowledge is on the table, and you can speak about it, and you can start to combine those symbols or also find maybe the one symbol that speaks for the entire group. So that's one part of the work, and I hope I, I'm able to, to explain myself and I was able to inspire you. It would be lovely to be in touch with you, and for those who want to do so, that's one of the ways to do it. Yeah, and I say thank you for the invitation, and enjoy the rest of the forum, of the conference. The World Knowledge Forum.